John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word. For the book of John, the Word came first. Everything else, light, earth, creatures of the land and sea, even mankind is what happens when the Word speaks. So today, we let the Word speak, and then let everything else, healings, salvation, direction, worship and prayer be the response to the Word. John says, all things were made by the Word, and without Him, nothing was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was first, the Word became flesh, and the Word is what we are going to declare today. Take a moment, take a breath, look back over this week. God was with you. Think of a difficult time. God was with you. Think of your past. God was with you. In your seat at this moment, God is with you. The fourth gospel describes a savior that is always very close to us, within reach, never failing. In the exploration of this gospel, we are allowing this book to be a guide for our service experience, allowing the word to lead us and everything else to be a response to God's word. Come on, give Jesus all that praise, everybody. Come on, that's pretty good. Now give him what he really deserves, everybody. It's awesome. All right. Give somebody a high five. Tell them you look like you've lost weight. Come on, tell them. Just give them some good news. I come to church. I want good news, everybody. It ain't ever true, but it's what I love to hear. <laughs> I got the spiritual gift of eating. Can I get an amen, somebody? It's a true story, actually. I, I set a goal this year to lose 20 pounds. I, I, you know, we start off the year with a fast, so I get a good start at prayer and fasting. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds over, over 2018. Don't you think that's doable? And so, so I thought, well, I can do this. And so I'm just, I'm happy to report, y'all, we're here in March and I only have 30 pounds to go. Come on, somebody. So y'all pray for me. We're gonna make it in Jesus' name. So I couldn't, I can't tell you how honored uh, I am very honored to stand in this place. I don't take it for granted. Um, the sacrifice that you've made and the leadership has made for just this to become a reality. And um, I don't ever feel like I really even deserve to be here. I'm just grateful to stand in front of you and to worship with you. And I'm like you. I could worship the rest of the time too. I'm a, I'm a true worshiper at heart. I led worship uh, as an associate for 18 years. And so I, I, I'm telling you, there's, there's an anointing on this church, and that song is an awesome song, and I'm telling you, and that doesn't happen everywhere. I hope you realize the miracle that you are in for that kind of presence to be in this place. Can you give Jesus the praise for that? It's awesome. And, um, and of course, that, that happens because you're, also, you're an awesome church, you know, and, uh, but it also, and we serve an awesome God, but it never happens without great leadership. And I think you guys already know this. Um, I've gotten to know your pastors, um, less than a year now. I mean, it felt like it was, Pastor Stephen was someone that just, when I met him, I knew we were supposed to know each other the rest of our lives. And I had known of you uh, because this church is, is known. Uh, and I knew of you. Uh, it was, but the second we met each other, we knew we were supposed to do life together. And, um, and we've gotten very close over a short period of time. And uh, in fact, we spent all day to, together yesterday just talking about you and his dreams, and he'd cry about five times. Y'all know that, everybody? He just cried and talk about you some more and then cry again. Oh, Lord Jesus, man, this guy's got some passion. He's got passion. He's got passion mixed with brilliance, mixed with strength of leadership, and just, come on, are you grateful for your pastors, Stephen and Erica, too? God, you guys are a blessing. Come on, give them a good hand. It won't hurt their feelings. Yeah. And I also want to bring honor to your founding pastors, Mike and, um, and Kathy, and just said, what a bless. I love you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, yeah. Come on, show some honor. Come on, show some honor. <laughs> I love you. Come on, we give God all the glory, but it's okay to honor people. Isn't that right? God gets the glory, but it's good. It's good to honor because um, you don't know the tears and the prayers and the sacrifice. I'm telling you, I mean, because I've been a senior pastor now for 17 years. I'm going to tell you, it's more than you think. 
Uh, it's just a whole lot more. And there, there are days, I don't even know this, but I know it's true that there are days that they both wanted to quit and they didn't and they're here and they're serving. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what it's like in the, in the back room. They're, they're, you think they're awesome, they're even better. They're the real deal. They love God, they're thinking about you and, and I honor both of you guys, you're, you, all your families, you're a blessing uh, to God. I bring greetings to my wife, Tammy, um, and, and my five kids, everybody. Come on, somebody say, help him, Lord, yeah. I don't know where the line is, but we crossed it. Amen, everybody? That's a lot of kids. Somebody said, boy, you must really like kids. I said, no, I don't. I I really like my wife. Come on, somebody. So you got that all wrong. So anyway, and I I got stuff to say about that. You need to bring me back to your marriage conference, what you need to do. So anyway, so, um, (laughs) and I am a Cajun from South Louisiana. Uh, Come on, baby. See, we know what real food tastes like, and, uh, and I'll tell you, I always tell people that because I, I, to lower your expectations, all right? Because <laughs> Louisiana's 50th on every list there is, all right? So maybe 49, thank God for Arkansas. Come on, somebody. So, anyway, I just, I'm so sorry. Bad pastor. I won't. So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> But I tell you that because you might not learn anything, but we're going to have a good time together in church, all right? I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I grew up, I was mad when they said unto me. I was sad when they said unto me. I decided, I decided that, that one of the things that we need to do is, is, is just lift your spirit. You should leave here better than you came. And we already have experienced that, and I hope to do the same. I've, just, I've got a simple message and not much time because you're a pastor. Anyway, so... <laughs> I want, you to, I want you to open your Bibles, your iPhones, your iPads, your eyelids on the screen if you ain't got any. Okay, we'll, um, we'll, we'll share God's Word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing place. There's no place like this place. God, it's your presence, your people, your Word. There's nothing better. And God, we honor you. We honor, God, what, it, what you've done in our lives. And we make more room in our hearts for you to speak to us and change us by the power of of a book that's not a normal book. Your book is alive. It has the ability to change us. It literally contains the power for its own fulfillment. And so, God, we make room in our hearts for you to do something we weren't even expecting. And we thank you for it in advance. And all God's people said a good yeah. amen. All right. One of, my, one of my habits before I come to speak anywhere is I always watch several weeks back of what you guys have covered so I, so I can step into the flow. I'm I want to serve you. I don't, I, don't have, I don't come here with agenda. If I tell the pastors, man, what do you want? How can I help you? And, and so I watch messages, and I be- prepared a message for you. And then when I watched last Sunday's message by, by Ryan, um, is exactly the text and everything. I'm like, well, man, the brother done stole my message. And so <laughs> anyway, so Maybe, maybe there is a Holy Spirit and just got ahead of him before I was listening. I don't know. And so, um, so I told you, Pastor Steve, I said, well, let me tell you what else I can do. He goes, no, 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 no. Teach on that again. It's, it, it, tell, go bring your angle to that same message because we're in this series around the, the book of John. And when I heard that, I thought, man, I know exactly where I want to go, especially with Easter two weeks away. And so uh, Ryan didn't leave much meat on that bone, but I'm going to nibble the little piece that's left, all right? In, in, in John chapter four, he so eloquently and beautifully preached the story about Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. I won't rehearse all of that, but you'll remember the disciples had run an errand, and so Jesus just happened to be alone. One of the, Actually, one of the few times he is alone in that kind of a way, and he strikes up a conversation, breaks every social norm to even talk to a woman, which they did not do in public. You, didn't, you weren't even really permitted to even show affection to your spouse in public. You just didn't. And so he's, he breaks those cultural norms, of course, breaks the racial tension between Jews and Samaritans and strikes up this conversation. And But the story picks up in verse 27 that, that just then the disciples return. And, and I want you to picture this. So Jesus, imagine this bistro table is the well. There it got armed load of groceries. They come around the corner and they're shocked. They're like, my, we'll look, we'll look at there. And the Bible says they were surprised to find him talking to a woman for the reasons that Ryan and I have just said to you. But then John does something that you don't do when you're writing a story. 
he includes details that didn't happen. So if you've ever written a story or told a story, you don't go through a list of stuff that didn't happen, and John does. And I want you to know that there's not one single detail of Scripture that that's, that's there by accident. Every verse, every, every little detail is there on purpose. So if you look into the detail, because he says, look, let me tell you what didn't happen when we walked around the corner and saw him. He says, no one asked, what can I do for you? Which would have been something you probably should have said every moment you were with Jesus if you're the disciple. Lord, can I get you anything? I've, I've only been here 24 hours, and your team has asked me that a hundred times. You want something to drink? You want something to eat? Can I get this? You want to stand up? You want to sit down? What do you like? You want to go here? You want to go there? Like, I'm fine. Y'all, no, 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 Pastor, we want to serve. I'll, I'll carry I'll carry that. Can I carry that? Like, they just, they just serve. They're, they're just really they're amazing hosts and, and serving. That's just normal. That's, that's what you call courtesy. And John said, we didn't do that. There's a reason why. It's there on purpose. He says, and no one also, no one asks, why were you talking to that woman? So if you're a disciple and your teacher's doing something you don't understand, you ask, and they didn't. And John says, man, I sure do regret that, looking back on this story. And then it says, and then leaving the water jar, the woman goes back to her town, which was really not a, another city town. It's a village around the corner because she's going to come right back from her town in a matter of minutes. And she says, and she went to her town. She says, I think I found God. Come see a man who told me everything about my life. I think I found the Christ and she and says, and they came out of the town. So just in a matter of minutes, the town people are coming. And I've got an imagination. I, I see humor in scripture too. And so I, I see things kind of through the lens of funny, you know. And so I'm picturing this lady leading this pack of 50 or 100 people going, there he is. You know, and the disciples are standing there not doing some things. And uh, they're, you know, and, and so it says, then they came out of the town, and made their way toward them. And then the next word's really funny to me. Again, I see humor. It says, meanwhile, so while the town is coming toward them and then some not, non things are not happening here, meanwhile, the disciples, watch what they say. The disciples say, Rabbi, let's go to P.F. Chang's. Are y'all seeing that, everybody? All right, all right. <laughs> Which, as you can look at me and tell, I like to eat. But there's a time to eat and there's a time not to eat, right? So, like, that, that, that's a great comment unless the town's coming towards you, right? And so then Jesus does something that he would often do, that if you brought up a, brought up a topic, he would use your topic as a metaphor to teach you a spiritual truth. So he says then, he says, well, guys, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. And you guys, you know what that means. You mean, like, no, guys, I like food too, but let's, hey, how about we talk to the town people? That'd be, they're all coming to find out if I'm God or not, right? That'd be just a good thing to talk about right now. And then the disciples said, so they, the disciples said to each other, now watch this, could someone have already brought him, did you already eat and wait, did not wait for us to get back? I mean, are, are y'all seeing that? There, there's humor in there, right? And here's the point I want you to notice with me is, is, is how much they're missing the moment. And if they can miss the moment, can we miss the moment? And the answer is yes, by the way, if you wanna go ahead and just say yes. It's, we can miss it, right? Because no one asks, no one asks what do you want, so they're not thinking about his needs. They're not thinking about what he wants. No one asked why were we talking to the woman because no one cared why he was talking to the woman. They were hungry. They wanted to go to P.F. Chang's, right? So that's what they're thinking, right? And so they're not even missing the teaching now that he's trying to give. No, 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 guys. So Jesus tries round number two. He goes, no, guys, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his, say the next word out loud, finish his. Work. Come on, every campus, finish his. Work. We got work to do, guys. Great thing to do, eat lunch, unless there's work to do. Let's, how about we do the work right now? And he says, and you guys have a saying, or don't you have a saying? In other words, it's a colloquialism. It's something that was common in their day. We don't have this saying, but they had a saying for, for procrastination. So if you didn't want to do something, you would say four months more than the harvest. And it, but it was just a saying. And it meant, <laughs> let's don't do it now. Let's do it later. Like, we can harvest, but not today. Four months more than the harvest. And then Jesus says, he, he isolates the problem in this next line. He says, I tell you, say the next three words out loud. I tell you, open your, okay, say it one more time. I tell you, open your He goes, I got, I, here's the problem. You, you don't see what I see. That's the, you don't see, you just don't see what I see. And I tell you, open your eyes, look into the fields, they are ripe for harvest. I think one of the most important ingredients for the church one of the important, most important messages for the church to hear is, and really the prayer to pray is, God, I wanna be able to see 
this Dallas Metroplex through your lens. I want to see my family the way you see. I need to see my boss the way you see. God, open. You, we've got to see better if we're going to be the church that he wants us to be. Amen, everybody? Uh, you can tell I'm wearing glasses. Um, and I had perfect eyesight for most of my life. I'm 54 years old. Um, and, and at about 47... I was at a football game. My boys were playing high school football, and I was squinting to read the names on the back of the jerseys, and my, my sister handed me her glasses. She was sitting next to me, and, and, and like my whole world came in high definition again. It's like, oh, my goodness, you know, because I didn't realize it had, it had gone. And so I didn't go to the eye doctor for two more years. Um, I don't know why perfect eyesight was not at the top of my to-do list, but what is not? But anyway, so I, I finally went to the eye doctor, and it's real strange if you've never been, so I know some of you probably have never been. It's very odd, because they do stuff, you think you're going there to see better, the first thing they do is start blinding you with chemicals, and stuff. like, no, brother, we're going the wrong direction right here, this is not how you do this. And so, I, was, I didn't know, I really didn't know, I honestly didn't know, and they blew, they blew air in my eyeball, like, what was that? He goes, oh, that was a glaucoma check. I'm like, well, Warner Brother first. You know, let me know. You're going to be blowing stuff in my eye, you know. And they sit real close, and they do all kind of weird stuff. Anyway, get a Tic Tac or back up, you know. And so, anyway, <laughs> make you make decisions, A or B, or B or A. You're like, A or B. Like, I don't know. They both look good. T slow down, you know. So, anyway, it's just all kind of, it's, it's odd. So, he leaves. This is a true story. I'm really not making this up. He leaves, and he goes, well, we got you figured out. I'm like, well, great. That's your job, you know. Like, what's the deal? He goes, well, you're nearsighted. I said, you've got it completely backwards. I got the near stuff's perfectly fine. I've got far issues. All my issues are far. They're out there. And he goes, no, that's what, see, you're laughing because you know that's what they call it. It's literally the only medical profession on earth that names your condition for what you're good at. <laughs> it's like going to the doctor with a broken arm and he says, well, your legs work. I mean, that's backwards. It's not how you say it. Talk about the problem. Anyway, so I, I told him, so that's dumb. That's, that's the, y'all are back, that's backwards. He goes, well, that's what we call it. Anyway, so I'm on a mission to change it, by the way. So um, <laughs> I'm pulling out of the doctor's office, and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I mean, just because I'm a simple guy, I need simple truth. You know, I, I like the cookies on the bottom shelf where everybody can have one, you know. And so I, I, um, I, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, you know, that, that can be your condition, your spiritual condition too, Chris. And it can, it's definitely the spiritual condition of a lot of my church. And that is that spiritual nearsightedness is when you just focus your life around what's close to you. Because, because you really don't feel responsible for that which you cannot see. I would submit to you, the disciples weren't making a decision not to reach the town people. They didn't see the town people. They could only see their own stomachs. So they wanted to go to lunch so bad they couldn't see. Their, their, their own needs blinded them. I think we get blinded by our needs in the church. I think we actually think that God's job is for, to eternally be there for us at our beckoning call. Can I just say to you, the hope of the gospel is that you are transformed into his likeness so you can spread an aroma to a city that's lost and going to hell. That's the hope of the gospel. I mean, it's really kind of all about you until you get saved. But once you get saved, he wants you on his team to be salt and life to a world that doesn't know. That's the hope of the gospel. Yeah, we get focused by our own needs or many times we can get insulated and just forget about others. I, I work at a church, right? So I'm around Christians all the time. It's easy to forget. So I have to initiate disciplines. Like I, I've taken every one of my five kids one at a time to the Los Angeles Dream Center the Barnett's lead out in Los Angeles, just because they got to see like somebody hunched over and shooting up heroin in their arm on Skid Row. My son, Jonathan, life was changed when he saw that. Like, all right, now it's different now, isn't it? Yes, sir, dad, I'm never the same. I mean, like this changed my life. Why? Because I could see it. We can't, we can't let ourselves get all comfortable in here and sing our songs and forget there's somebody laying on their bed right now in Colleyville and Frisco and they're thinking about, I think I'm gonna end my life today. No, 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 we don't exist for us. We can't get insulated and enjoy all this. Come on, somebody say amen. It's important. And honestly, I think spiritual nearsighted, it makes us people who kind of forget, we forget the heart of the one that we serve. And you gotta, I want you I want to say something to you, and it's gonna be a little hard to, to, to swallow, so just get, just get ready for me. And you don't have to have me back, if it, all right? So just, but it really is true. And that is, God loves you very much, 
but he's not thinking about you as much as you think he is. Three times in one chapter, Luke chapter 15, Jesus said that he would be willing to leave 99 found things to go find one lost. He's distracted by that which is lost. He will leave found to go find lost. He's, that's the way God's motivated. So he, he, he peeks down here in, 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 into this congregation and goes, wow, that's, there they are worshiping me. And then he, his attention goes right back to 4.7 billion people who don't even, don't even know him yet. And those aren't heathens. Those are kids that are lost. They just, all of, them are, all of us are kids. Just some of us are found kids and some of us are lost kids. And he's distracted by that, which is, he, if you've ever lost something of value, you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever lost, like, your wallet? Like, when you lost your wallet, you don't make an inventory. You don't go, well, there's my couch. No, you don't do that. <laughs> you, you, only thing you can think about is I've got to find my wallet. I gotta, it's, it's around here. I know it is. It's somewhere, it's, it's, right? Because you're distracted by that. Which I actually lost one of my five kids once. Uh, it's funny now. People always laugh. Like, it was kind of funny, but it wasn't that day. We were, we actually, I did seven years of ministry as a youth pastor in Colorado. And so had three of my five kids were born in Colorado. So we, I wanted to bring all my kids back and, and to teach them how to ski. And, and Tammy and I both ski pretty well, you know, because we lived there for so long. And so we, we had gone with a couple of families in our church to go skiing for a few days. On the last day, we're not going to ski. We're just going to hang out in the village, the ski village. And so, in fact, I, got, I brought a picture of it because I went back and took a picture so I could tell this story. We, we actually started the day by going into this Starbucks that you see on the screen. And so there's 20-something people, and we're all getting our coffee orders. And my youngest of my five kids is autistic. And he, he's pretty high-functioning, but in a crisis situation, he really kind of seizes up, and he can't communicate very well at all. Right after we finish our coffee orders, we're just about done. Joseph decides to go into the bathroom, doesn't tell anybody, and we don't notice it. So we come out of Starbucks, and we went right into that marble slab creamery. We want to eat our way down the street. Come on, somebody, all right? <laughs> you can take the picture down. But So Joseph comes out. We're in there, and he doesn't see us, and he goes the other way. Well, just that week, a girl named Heather was abducted in that very village. They found her dental remains on what looked like an altar in the, in the mountains of Colorado. Yeah, that's how they discovered who it was. I, I meet, my mind goes to that story. Somebody's got my son. And I freak out. And I tell everybody, y'all, Joseph's missing. And like choreography, 20-something people went 20-something different directions. Panicked, looking for Joseph. And so I found a security guard. He's leaned up against a building, arms folded. And I said, sir, in the most frantic way I could say, sir, 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 you got to help me find my son Joseph. He's a little redheaded. He's 12 years old. He can't speak very well. He's autistic. And, and he never unfolded his arms. He said, well, did you look the last place you saw him? Can I confess my sins in church? Is that all right? I just, I wasn't very representative at that point. And I'm like, man, bro, you the one with the radio, help me out. And I was like, help me. And, and like, and, he, and I was irritated by his inactivity because something of value to, was missing from me. Like, really? Help me. And he wasn't getting the urgency of my moment there. I think sometimes God looks down and goes, really? You know, this didn't happen, but can you imagine my other four kids coming up and saying, Daddy, hey, Daddy, what are we doing for dinner tonight? That's a great question unless Joseph's missing. It's a horrible question if Joseph's missing. Can you imagine what our prayers might sound like to God? Hey, Daddy, Daddy, can we? Really? Really, that's what you want to talk about? I mean, really, wouldn't you agree with me that spiritual nearsightedness might be best revealed in how we pray? Because if God could answer, if he answered every prayer you pray, would it change the world or just change us? Yeah, chances are, I know for me, it would just like, it's, it's a lot of me's and my's in my prayers. No, 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 open your eyes, open your eyes. I need you to see there's a town, there's a town. And it's what I'm thinking about. It's my food. It's what I would love for us to be doing right now. And I found Joseph um, 25 grueling minutes later, and um, his little red blushed face from sobbing for 25 minutes, he just, <laughs> just looking side to side, back and forth, and I saw him, and I, Joseph, and he turned, and he made this mad dash toward me, and we embraced, and he says, Daddy, Daddy, where, where are you? 
I'm about to turn Stephen on y'all here right now. Man, that story messes me up. And, um, man, you, you messing with me, brother. What's up, man? <laughs> and um, I've been a different pastor ever since. So, so from that day forward, I have told Pastor Mike, I've, I've told that story in our membership class. I tell that story and I say, look, if you're looking for a church just for you, you might as well keep shopping. This ain't the one. Because we're, we're gonna try to take care of your needs, but we're gonna do anything and everything short of sin to reach as many people as we can because that's, the church is the hope of the world and we don't exist for us, we exist for the world. That's, we are the church. And so if you hate parking problems and lots of people, you, there's a bunch of churches you can pull your car right up to the front door, man. Just go there. But if you're looking for a church that might say, hey, we need you to go to a different service time because we need your seat in that poor popular service, and you, you understand the Joseph story, you'll go, I love this traffic jam. I love these problems. Yes, absolutely. What do you need me to do? And I just think it's something that God would say to every one of us. So what I do in this membership class is actually teach evangelism to our church uh, in about four minutes. Because I think the church has made it too hard and most people are frightened by the, by the, even the idea of teaching evangelism. So I just make it simple. And I think there are four ingredients that, and if you're a note taker, jot these on your phone or your Bible or something, just if you like taking notes, here you go. And that is, I think all of us need to accept the responsibility that we're on the search team. Like God, let me say it this way. And that is that you're God's plan and he doesn't have a plan B. You're it. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. Yeah, he, that, we are, 2 Corinthians 5 says, we are his ambassadors as though God were making his appeal to planet earth through his church. Ephesians 3.10 says that it was his intent, God's intent, that the whole wisdom of God be made known through his church. We're, Ezekiel 33 says, if you don't sound the alarm, and you know there's danger ahead, and there is. Their blood is on your hands. I mean, that's pretty strong language, right? It matters to God. We're the plan. We're the plan. We have to accept that. Number two, we do it by developing a personal relationship. So let me say it this way. Don't get focused on issues. Issues separate. When someone tries to pull you into a conversation about issues. I just finished a book called The Daniel Dilemma. What I marvel about Daniel is, is that he stood for his faith, never wavered, and had influence at the same time. How did he do it? He did it by connecting before he ever corrected. I'm not gonna go to this place of telling you what's wrong with you. I'm, 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 gonna, de I'm, gonna, I'm gonna develop a relationship with you so that number three, I can get the opportunity to share with you my personal story. Now this will set you free because most people think evangelism is telling the person what's wrong with them. <laughs> you better get right or you're gonna get left, right? We have these, these sayings. You better turn or burn, right? That's... Or as they say in Alabama, you're going to go to hell. It's two syllables, hell, hell, you're going to hell. And that's not our message. Come on, y'all, that's not our message. The Bible says, Jesus said, let your light shine in front of men that they see how you live your life and they'll want your God in heaven. How do you do that? Let me tell you my story. I'm not talking about you. I'm going to tell you what he did for me. Let me tell you the difference he's made in me. You're supposed to walk into the office tomorrow and they go, what in the world happened to you? I went to Covenant Church. It's just the best day ever. Like, they're supposed to let your light shine before men. They want to see your God in heaven. Come on, say amen right there. Amen. It's, import it's important. It's important for us to, 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 to we're, not, we're not to be the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, or the defender. We're supposed to be the witness. You're, you're my witnesses. Tell your side of the story. Come on, that'll preach by itself. And I ain't even a preacher. All right. Number four, so that we can eventually give them an invitation. I love this one because some of you know how to lead people to Christ, but a bunch of you don't. I tell our church, if you don't know how to lead somebody to Christ, don't worry about it. Lead them to church. And I, I've asked Pastor Stephen if I could challenge you with this. This is a challenge. I'm just going to tell you this straight up. This is a challenge. All right. And I tell my church, if this is going to be your church. There are 52 Sundays. You can have 50 of them. But two out of the 52 have an unchurched, far from God sitting person sitting next to you in church. Just give me two out of the 52. And that's why, by the way, this year we'll have more than 25,000 first-time visitors recorded, documented, like names and addresses. 
And it's only because I've taught them. And I ask them, because you're good people, you just need to be asked. We're asking. Two out of the 52 have somebody, and it's gonna gonna make you nervous. You're gonna sweat a little bit more. You're you're gonna wish they did certain songs and not other songs. You're gonna gonna think, man, I hope Pastor Stephen's on today. You know, I had a lady walk out three Sundays ago to the front. I was in the middle of worship. She goes, Pastor, Pastor, I have my friend here. I said, great. She goes, oh, please don't blow it. I'm like, I got you, girl. <laughs> it's going to be fine. It's going to be good. But you, listen to me. You need to feel that tension. That tension is a good tension for you to feel. And you need, you need to have them sitting there. And when they say every head bowed, every eye closed, you don't. You head bowed, one eye closed. You're like, <laughs> you want to see what your friend's going to do. You, you will say, when, that, when their tears coming down their face and their hands goes up, you'll say that's the favorite service you ever attended in church. You need to know. Why? Because on that moment, you captured the heart of your God. You understood what it's really, it's really all about. So in two weeks, you have the best opportunity of the year. So let me say it this way. Not all Sundays give you the same opportunity. Studies say that 84% of unchurched people will say yes to an, to an Easter invitation. So they're going to say no on the other Sundays, but they're going to say yes on this one with an invite. Come on, everybody. Get them, get them there and watch what happens. Let God do something great in their lives. So I'll close with this story. So several years ago, I was traveling to go speak for a friend in Boston. And when I got on the Delta flight from Cincinnati to Boston, the guy that was with me didn't get the chair next to me. So I had to land and speak, and I was exhausted, and I wanted to take a nap. So I was thinking, while the bo- plane's still boarding, if I'll get in nap posture before this mystery person shows up, they ain't going to talk to me, right? I, I'll, so I fake, I'm, I'm fake sleeping up against the wall, but I'm peeking too, sizing people up, you know, because they're coming around the corner, and I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, please not him. You know, you ever done that? <laughs> so anyway, I get my guy who sits next to me, and, um, and so I actually fall asleep and he elbows me in my ribs like after we had gotten in the air. And he goes, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> Are you serious? I was in dead sleep and, and, and I said, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And when I said that, he starts bawling, crying, like, like the whole plane can hear it loud. And just like, bro, what's, what's going on, man? Because I just buried my best friend. I'm never gonna see him again. I'm never gonna, I mean, it's real loud. Like, all right, bro, it's all right. And so his name was Billy. And I said, well, Billy, it's going to be okay. And I'm, I'm thinking of a verse. And I think about that verse in 1 Thessalonians that says that Christians grieve, but not like that. It, does, it says that. It says we grieve, but not like the rest of men who have no hope. So I, so I said, I said, well, Billy, the Bible says, he goes, no, don't go there. I said, why not? He goes, I'm Jewish. I said, Jesus was a Jew. He goes, all right, go ahead. I mean, that's, that's, I am... I'm not making that up, not even a little bit. <laughs> and, um, and I said, I said, the Bible says the reason why you're crying so hard is because it's over. It's really over for you. I, I cry too, but not like this because I get to see them again. I said, I, we grieve, because, like, not like this because we have hope. And then he says, well, how do you get the hope? <laughs> he put that, that ball on the tee. If you can't hit that, you can't play. You know what I'm saying? He was just <laughs> right there. And so I explained the gospel to him. We get off the plane and he goes, Chris, pray with me that I get the hope. I said, well, you need to confess Jesus is your Lord. I said, he said, I'm ready. And right there in the middle of Logan International Airport, Billy from Boston prayed to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior, gave his life to Jesus. Yeah. And he goes, oh, you're right. I have hope. I said, I told you. It's great. He goes, man, I got to do something for you. He goes, no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. You can't. You, it's my joy. He goes, look. He said, how many boys you have? I said, I said four. He goes, why are you asked? He says, well, I was, I was, I'm good friends with the great Hall of Fame relief pitcher, Dennis Eckersley from the Red Sox. He said, can I, can I send your boys some hand-signed baseball cards for Dennis Eckersley? I said, yeah, go ahead. I handed him my business card. And sure enough, a few days later, I got in the mail these four hand-signed baseball cards that I have never given to my boys. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> kind of feels good to get that off my chest in church, by the way. So anyway. <laughs> it's a true story. I, I filed three of them. 
that I might give to him one day. And I put, put it on the screen. I'll show it to you. And, I, and I, keep, I keep one on my desk. That card right there is on my desk right now. Let me close. Listen, listen, listen. listen. It stays on my desk. I see it every day. I, put, I touch it every day. I do. And I, and it, listen. And I, I tell God, I say, you know, the nap was good for me, but not napping was good for Billy. Let make sure I see. It reminds me to see that, that, that lunch was good for the disciples, but, but not going to lunch was good for the town. I mean, coming to Easter is going to be good for you. Coming to Easter with a friend is good for the city. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Come on, give Jesus praise. Come on, let's pray together. Father, I pray for a mighty anointing of evangelism in this place. Yeah, you can stand. Come on, stand with me. There's a mighty anointing in this place. God, give us eyes to see our neighbors, friends, co-workers the way you see them. We want to know you, Lord God. Help us to reach our city. Every head bowed, eyes are closed. I'm not going to call you to the front. But if you came here like Billy and you're far from God, maybe you're a Christian and you're just far from God. He seems a million miles away and you're ready to come home. Would you just wave at me? Let me pray for you. Come on, all over this room. That's me. That's me. Good, 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 good. Anybody else? Yep. Anybody else? Yep. Good job, my man. Anybody else? I'm just, yep, thank you. Anybody else? A lot of men. Come on, we have this couple up here. Anybody else? I'm just far from God. I need the hope. I need the hope. Anybody else want to join them? Come on, church, pray together. Say, Jesus, thank you for going to the cross, paying for my sin. Today I receive forgiveness. I receive hope. I give you my life. Forgive me for going my own way. From this day forward, I'm going to give you my best and give you my all. Thank you for saving me. In your name I pray. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a praise together, everybody. God bless you.